Let me get started uh, with a bit of background about the company. I'd just start with a quick introduction. We're a uh, relatively new company out of Silicon Valley here in California uh, with a number of uh, engineers working on this technology. Perhaps the most interesting thing to point out is the technology was originally developed in the defense industry uh, where the disasters they need to recover for, from are, for example, incoming missiles aimed at ships and so forth. Hopefully none of you ever have to deal with disasters quite so dramatic as that, but you can see why that environment needed to have a more automated, uh, rapid way of recovering. And our company is all about taking that technology and applying it uh, to the commercial world. So that's what we'll be talking about today. As I'm sure you're all aware, after all, you're motivated enough to join me today, the importance of protecting the digital assets and applications of companies are, are more important than ever. This has been something that's been really uh, interesting to me as I get to meet uh, customers and prospects as they travel around the country, which is that uh, Increasingly, computers are on the very front lines of, of this. Just one story that illustrates this point. I was talking to a customer who is in the commercial refrigeration line of work and he said, you know, years ago, the only thing they used computers for was for um, printing bills. And as he jokingly said, if I have a computer crash and the bills are two days late, why the customers never call to complain their bills late? Now, though, increasingly they use their computer just to monitor the uh, warehouses of food and produce and so forth that they're refrigerating. And that's part of the service they provide. So his tolerance for downtime has decreased from, from days to minutes. And, and that's, of course, very similar to what you'd see at a law firm. Uh, accountancies, a lot of accountants, of course, the day before taxes are due, there's no way they can afford their computers to be out for a couple of days. So just in every sort of form of business, uh, the need to make sure that the computers are always available after any sort of disaster is, is really key. Well, here's some interesting statistics to share. Um, this is a start with a survey that the Aberdeen Group did where they discovered the downtime cost of mid-sized companies. So we're not talking, you know, something huge here. We're not talking about Boeing or Citibank, just a typical mid-sized company uh, can cost an average of $74,000 an hour. And, uh, you know, that may um, uh, seem like a lot, but I'd invite you to do some arithmetic, which is, you know, there's typically about 200 business days in a year, and there's uh, eight hours in a day, typically in business days. So roughly speaking, that's about 1,600 hours of business a year. Divide that into the revenue or the budget or what have you of your company, you have sort of a feeling for the number of digits. Now, that assumes that it's all equally spaced. That's not necessarily true. If you're, for example, an accountant and it's April 14th, there's a lot more revenue flowing through at that time, at that peak time, than there would be uh, if you just look at the average. But I think a lot of our customers, when they start out, don't really think about that number, and it turns out to be a key number to have some feel for because it's that order of magnitude that tells you uh, how much a day of outage is going to cost you. Um, this, I think, leads to that second figure, which is, is uh, comes out of ESG's research that most people feel that more than about an hour or so it's going to start having an impact on their revenue and uh, other adversities. One adversity that is increasingly common among our customers that they cite is not the, just the obvious ones of revenues or whatnot, but the worry that if their computers were down, somebody would go on Yelp or some other social network and comment about that, and it would hurt their reputation for being a reliable supplier. So that's up the, uh, up the consideration as well. And then this last one, which is remarkable, but only, you know, only about a quarter of uh, businesses have actually tested their backup plan. And as I said earlier, if we've learned one lesson uh, from all these experiences is that any plan that isn't regularly tested isn't really reliable. Another case study from a while back comes from New Orleans. And of course, when we hear about New Orleans in the context of disasters, we tend to think about Katrina. But actually, this happened five years after Katrina. Uh, an interesting thing because they managed to survive uh, perhaps the worst hurricane in U.S. history, but one of the very worst, and yet it was a, a simple hard drive failure that got them uh, in this case. What happened was the parish of Orleans, and, and in Louisiana, the counties are called parishes, if you're not familiar with that, their civil district court maintains an index computer that explains where all the property transaction records are kept. It's across a couple floors of, of books of mortgage records. Uh, unfortunately, this uh, computer crashed, and um, uh, they had not been testing it, uh, how to restore, and unbeknownst to them, they really didn't have recoverable data. In the end, the only way to remedy this situation was to uh, re-enter by hand all the data from all those books. Uh, close to 200,000 records had to be manually re-entered, which, of course, is, is quite the, the nightmare. And New Orleans in that area could not no one could buy or sell or refinance a house uh, for about three months while they went through that process. Uh, the, um, the 
the interesting sort of side about this is the ACLU has recently sued because one thing that people rely on property records for is as collateral with bail bondsmen. So some people couldn't be released from jail even because of this problem to give you a sense of how widespread it was. Now, uh, the CTO there, see your picture there on the bottom, had actually raised uh, the need for money to allow testing and other improvements to be ready. Didn't get that money. Uh, sadly, the people who turned her down, uh, well, they're still employed, but uh, sadly the CTO is not. Uh, really a, a disappointing case where a few hundred dollars or a thousand dollars could have saved what ended up being hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of damages uh, just because of uh, um, inadequate preparation and especially inadequate testing. Here's one that's uh, quite recent. This is a client of ours in uh, the New York area. That's an actual overhead photograph of Lower Manhattan uh, when the uh, Superstorm Sandy uh, caused the flooding and the outages, particularly of power. Um, in this case, uh, uh, this is a 24/7 is a, a talent agency. They sort of do temp talent uh, for the um, uh, entertainment and the modeling and things like that. Um, and uh, uh, they have offices, as you'd expect, in Lower Manhattan, just south of Houston Street and Soho, and then also over in the L.A. area. And you can see Doug there had the system, and, and he was able to test it quite regularly. Uh, he actually doesn't use the cloud. What he does is have an appliance both in L.A. and New York, and they're acting as a disaster recovery site for each other. And that's another way to set this up, but it gives them the geographical diversity they want. And during the storm, what they were able to do was just transfer all their operations over to the L.A. office, and uh, just keep right on going and, and didn't cause any problem at all, considering that a key thing that they do is turn around um, uh, requests very quickly, and uh, payroll and personnel records are crucial to that. Um, that would have been a huge issue if they had been unable to operate uh, with uh, a loss of power for almost a week um, in their offices down there in, in uh, southern Manhattan. So uh, glad that they, they didn't weren't affected by that. We had other customers who, uh, you know, as the storm was approaching, ran through and just made sure that tested their procedures, made sure that it was working prop properly even if they weren't affected. Uh, but we do have customers who even lost homes, uh, but their data was protected. Uh, and if nothing else, it allowed them to concentrate on making sure their family was safe, knowing that their business applications were taken care of, and they could come back to that when they, they had taken care of that. So certainly a lot of lessons to be learned from that. Uh, it was a, a, a challenging time for a lot of people, and uh, just glad to see customers coming through that okay. So what are some of the lessons we can learn from all of this in, in terms of recovering from IT disasters in business. Well, I think the most important thing at the beginning here is that natural disasters tend to grab the headlines when there's hurricanes and tornadoes, of course, or, or out in California where we are, the earthquake worries. But one way or another, as scary as those things can be, they are uh, not the most typical. Much more typical are your more mundane problems. So in those, I would include facilities. And by that, I mean things that go wrong in the building. And you might think about fire, but actually we find that plumbing is much more common. Uh, you know, all it takes is the tenant upstairs to overflow a toilet and you can find your the lighting fixtures in your machine room have turned into shower heads and that's not good. Or uh, hardware failures, these are inevitable, disks failing, boards burning out, power supplies failing, those are quite common as well. A software problem, uh, updates that don't work out as I described earlier, and of course the uh, ever-present user error, as the, the pointy-haired boss goes and deletes all his email once again, how do you recover from that disaster? What I'd say is that what we discover is that there's a huge gap between ought to work and known to work. I'd say if there's there's uh, one thing I'd ask you to take away from today's webinar, it's uh, to make a make and keep a resolution to test your recovery systems on a regular basis. There is no bigger gap in technology than ought to work and known to work. And really the only way to bridge that gap is through frequent testing. So uh, uh, you have to assume that something that hasn't been tested recently probably won't work, and that's what we've seen in some of these cases. A couple other points is that backups tend to be automated now. It's something that everybody knows they need to do. So whatever backup system you have in place, those are automated. And yet most recoveries are not. They're going to involve getting the computers and the tapes and so forth. And that's a shame because, of course, recovery tends to happen in the stressful time uh, where having that automated so that you can have one click and be back in, in uh, business would be uh, really useful because of, of the stress and the excitement and so forth. Uh, and increasingly, it's not about backup but how fast you are backup. Uh, which is what matters to people and what they're judging these systems around. So what can you uh, do about this? Well, let's talk about the way people protect themselves. There's a couple of different ways there. Uh, one is uh, people can use traditional backup systems. Uh, the most common thing that we would see is somebody running some sort of backup software to tape. It's sort of surprising that technology is uh, you know decades old, but is familiar, and people uh, do that. The 
challenge with that, of course, is that you end up with these tapes. It's difficult to verify when he, whether anything actually ended up on those tapes. Uh, and the testing is, is somewhat inconvenient. And, of course, you also have the worry about getting the, the, the media off-site. Um, perhaps you use a professional service, an Iron Mountain, or somebody comes by to pick up those tapes. Uh, you know, I was recently talking to one person who says, well, I just try to remember to put them in my, the trunk of my car uh, before I leave in the evening. And it's, you know, better than nothing, I suppose, but still a bit worrisome. So as you think about rapid restore time, this is not going to cut it. It's going to take hours or days to get the tapes back and restore from them. People would like to do, if they were a large company, it would be to create a replicated data center. Certainly, if you were, you know, running the NASDAQ stock exchange, what you'd do is build multiple data centers and hook them all together and so forth. The challenge with this for most people is that the requirement for uptime may have, have gotten tighter, but their budget sure didn't get any bigger. And the notion that they can simply buy at least two of everything plus all the technology needed to hook it together is, is not practical for, for your mid-sized businesses. On top of that, of course, it's complex to integrate these sorts of systems and, and build them. Uh, there's a manual, for example, from VMware that involves the products from seven vendors, runs over 200 pages. It's a good manual. Certainly, if you have the wherewithal to have people dedicated to this kind of project, it's, it's not a bad idea. Uh, but this is not necessarily practical for a lot of people. A lot of discussion these days about the cloud, uh, backing up computers to the cloud. And certainly for personal use, uh, we strongly recommend this sort of thing. This makes great sense. I use one of these services for my home computers. Uh, but there's a difference there with two differences, really. It's, you know, a fair amount of data, but not that much. And more importantly is, you know, for my home computers, I don't really care about downtime. What I'm mostly worried about in that case is, for example, protecting my family photographs. As long as I can get them back in a week or two, that's fine. I just don't want them to be lost forever. However, for most businesses, that's not the case. First of all, they have a lot more data. We find that our typical customer has something like three to five terabytes of data or even more. And if you do the arithmetic about how long it would take to download that from the cloud over the Internet connection, why that could take a stretch into days or weeks. So practically speaking, that's not what people do. What they do is they call up their cloud storage company and then say, send me a disk. And you're back on the loading dock, waiting for the truck from FedEx to arrive, thinking to yourself, I thought I got away from tapes to avoid this sort of problem. And once again, the testing's a problem. So how do we go about dealing with this? Well, we've put together a converged infrastructure that certainly includes the storage aspects that were just described there. Uh, that's that backup repository, which uh, these days, of course, that's deduplicated for maximum efficiency going back in time. But that's not all that we include in our cloud. Most importantly, we also include uh, virtual machines to create you know, instant replicas of, of what you have, what we call one-click recovery, and have the ongoing automated migration to make sure that those are constantly up to date. Uh, we also, of course, include networking. And a big aspect of what we do is secure this data, both by encrypting it uh, in flight uh, and, and at rest, but also by making sure that it's behind actually two sets of firewalls and is only accessible through secure VPNs, which given the compliance concerns and, and uh, understanding of the healthcare industry is something that comes up quite a lot with our healthcare sort of customers. Although these days there's really no one who, who doesn't care about that. Uh, it gets special attention in this market segment. Uh, the key to all of this is automation and monitoring. The idea here is that uh, you know, just as something like a fire alarm is just one button and, and it goes off, Likewise, when you want to be able to recover, you want it to have it one click and, and happen quickly. So let's, let's look at how this actually works in, in customer environments. Here you have sort of a stylized view of that. You can see a, a set of people there accessing applications on Windows or Linux servers. And uh, what's been added to this environment is our hybrid cloud system. Uh, this consists of an appliance on-site and an off-site node, which is usually part of our cloud, although some customers prefer to run that themselves. Uh, either way, it's an off-site part. Why both? Well, as a practical matter, most disasters do not involve a hurricane wiping out the whole facility. Most of the disasters are much more mundane than that, just a, a dying power supply or bad firmware, as we heard earlier. Um, and in those cases, having an appliance on site is, is uh, much more convenient because everything can be done at land speed uh, and, and done in the same networking environment. Of course, it is possible that something could happen that would ruin the whole site, in which case having the off-site uh, cloud or, or otherwise uh, providing for off-site recovery is important in that set. And that's why uh, both of those things are included in the solution. If something goes wrong, uh, we have been capturing everything about all of those servers. So here you see the SQL server on the left had a failure. You can tell it failed because it turned red. Um, and uh, what's going on? Well, just like a regular backup, uh, we captured all the data as well as the applications and the operating system environment from that server. But beyond a traditional backup, what we've also done is constructed a complete uh, replica of that server such that through one click of a web button, uh, a copy of that can be brought up and running right away. 
and you have in that on-site uh, appliance uh, an exact replica of that SQL server that comes up in about two or three minutes, uh, about as long as, as it takes to, to boot up uh, the machine. And you can see everybody's back online, even though the original server hasn't been fixed yet, because there was a virtual replica ready to go, um, they're good to go. And I would point out that those machines can either be physical machines or they're often virtual machines. We're kind of agnostic about that, and most typically the environments we're protecting these days include some mix of physical and virtual machines. Now that's the scenario where just a machine on site uh, died, but of course it's possible that the whole site becomes inaccessible, in which case failover to the cloud would happen. Now the big difference between this cloud recovery and the one that you saw earlier is that the one earlier was just about storage. And so you had to get those bits back in touch with some sort of machine, physical or virtual, to run them if you wanted to be able to do recovery. In our case, in our cloud, we're actually running a, a constant update process, so we're constantly updating virtual replicas of your entire environment, such that if anything happens, uh, one or multiple of those can be brought back to life and ready to go. And uh, uh, that's a very handy thing, of course, if what you want to have is a recovery time of just a few minutes gives you sort of a feel for what the, the screens look like, standard sort of web-based control. But the reason I bring this up is to discuss testing. And as I said earlier, uh, we think that testing is one of the most important parts of this. But one nice thing here is that every single one of the servers is uh, booted up every time uh, the snapshot is taken. And uh, that way the, the administrator, the IT leader, knows that the, the server is ready to go because it booted up. So oftentimes people are going from, you know, maybe not testing at all or at best restoring from tape for a test once a quarter to knowing every single day, perhaps multiple times a day, that uh, the servers that, that they would use to recover booting off, booting up both on and off site. Um, this also allows people to bring it up in a test mode, not just on the production network, but allows people to bring it up in a test mode um, that allows them to, for example, uh, check on things. So for example, suppose you had an Oracle server and there's a new version that you'd like to test the upgrade on. Rather than risking your production environment, you can bring up the test clone version, apply the upgrade to that, if it works, great. You know that it's relatively low risk to apply it to your production environment. If something goes wrong, no harm. Just throw away that clone and figure out what went wrong and, and try again. And uh, that way you're not just recovering from disasters, you're avoiding them in the first place, which is, is uh, pretty crucial as well. Why are people looking at disaster recovery with these kind of hybrid cloud systems? Well, I believe that business IT systems are becoming more important than ever, and I think you believe that too, as we saw earlier uh, in the poll results. Uh, the amount of time, downtime that, that people can stand is steadily diminishing. It's simply no longer acceptable to say, oh, sorry, I can't help you today. The computers aren't working. And so, so this, of course, is always true if you're doing something like running a stock exchange. But, but even in, in the typical clinics and off, doctor's offices and so forth, people are having that always up kind of expectation and need to be able to prepare for it. And of course, even though the natural disasters get the attention and are the source of a lot of the stories, it's those mundane problems that we experience every day that are actually the majority of recoveries that we do for our customers each week. The good news is that, in addition, uh, new technology is making one-click recovery possible. You can go ahead and, and use this technology now, the combination of the cloud, virtualization, dedupe, as I mentioned, and, and ultimately automation to make sure that this is always up, running, ready, tested, 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 and ready to go, uh, and that's really crucial. And so uh, this sort of thing is dependable and easy. And the good news here is it's affordable. These sorts of systems are fitting into the same budget slot that people were traditionally spending on uh, uh, backup systems. So for roughly the same amount, um, what they find is that they can create a recovery time for their organization that's much better than they would have had before. Before, they would have had to get new computers, get those tapes back from storage. They were looking at several days to get that done. Now the new technology means that with roughly the same sort of expenditure, you can end up uh, with bringing the whole organization back in just a couple of minutes. It'll probably take longer to get everybody out of the office and resituated than it will to have the systems ready to go, ready to support them, ready to support your patients and, and everyone else. So I'll finish up here with just a snapshot of our uh, a set selection of our customers. You can see here that there's various banks, law firms, accountancies like you might expect, but also you can see there's a number of energy companies, electricity companies, manufacturing companies uh, in diverse industries, whether that's uh, everything from, from uh, paper to metalworking and so forth, a variety of customers. And what they all have in common is that they rely on their computer systems, on their applications, uh, not just for their own billing and record keeping, but increasingly to create a customer experience in terms of taking orders, taking in designs, taking other requests, and being ready to go at a moment's notice 
great quote there from uh, Wayne Bailey, the gentleman from Alabama, and how he's ready to go, and how this whole upgrade that he's put into his world is taking a lot of pressure off his mind, because he knows if something goes wrong, uh, they're ready to go uh, with a recovery system that'll take care of them.